And so now I'll we'll talk about the second thing is the crypto, crypto I like to call it the crypto populist. And what we mean by that is you know, cryptography and the, the apocalypse. And um, cryptography fundamentally is about using hard math problems to protect things. It's math that you can do very easily in one direction, but you can do very hard if you don't have certain information, certain secrets, certain keys to do it the other way. Um, when we talk about the crypto apocalypse, what we're saying is, wow, we're relying on all this math to keep things secret. What if someone breaks the math and finds a way to do the reverse very easy? Well, then all the things we thought were secret are not secret anymore. Um, what do we do then? And it's kind of an apocalyptic kind of scenario. Um, the stuff that's been happening with Edward Snowden, I like to call it a cold crypto apocalypse. It's kind of a like cold war where there's a lot of uncertainty and no one knows what's really going on. Um, there were two particular revelations that sort of underlined this. Um, the Bull Run revelation showed that the NSA and the UK GCHQ, which is the UK equivalent of the NSA, uh, government communications headquarters, um, had been using tricks to sort of undermine the security of the power. Um, they're clearly stealing or compelling uh, access to encryption keys that you can use to protect things like your transaction with Amazon and Google. Um, they appear to be planning moles in internet technology corporations, actually having NSA employees uh, get jobs in these, these uh, companies to exfiltrate certain kinds of stuff and get access to stuff. Um, they definitely, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, are, appear to have put back doors to certain cryptographic standards, at least one that we know of. Um, and, and it's unclear if it even is a back door. And they're hoarding vulnerabilities. So often companies will come to the NSA with a set of source code. Please look at how we implement this piece of cryptography. Let us know if there's any problems. And the NSA will say, yeah, here's a problem, here's a problem, here's a problem. But apparently they're keeping back key problems that they want to use later to exploit to get access to communications. The other one that's really that happened recently is a thing called muscular. And this is where the NSA is using the fact that there's very little constitutional oversight of things they do in other countries, because it's somewhere else, not here, to tap traffic between data centers, particularly between Yahoo and Google data centers over, overseas, and, it's, and keep a whole bunch of communications that they hope. otherwise normally wouldn't be able to get. Um, Obama set up a panel to study this, and fortunately it was five law professors. Um, they're all insiders, so there's people studying sort of the whole thing, right? And they're also the people connected to the Obama administration. Although one of them is Peter Squire, who wrote that thing I pointed to earlier about the golden age of surveillance. So he's sort of a surveillance skeptic. Um, the review panel asked the world for input, and we said, hey, um, my, myself and Dan Albright at the EFF said, you know, we, I think we can get a lot of technologists to sign on to something that will make key arguments that they can use to later tell Obama, hopefully, you can really need to do something different or not do this or something, you know, this is a problem. Um, here's the list, it's like, I don't know if you probably can't read that yet, so. Um, but it was about 47 people, a lot of Berkeley folks, uh, well, some Berkeley folks, Nick Doty was on it. So this is, again, showing you, I'm trying to get we try to get young people and recognize people with cachet. And uh, certain people were harder to get than others, but were key. For example, we got some foreign people. We could argue about the foreign case, so I'll talk a little bit. You know, we're tapping foreigners. Um, Ross Anderson from the UK, Stephen Carroll, who's uh, one of the security directors at IETF. Um, and if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. But also, we got people like Ruben Hendricks from the Core Project, which was an anonymous. Browser that uh, is one of the few things that keeps people alive in places like Iran, for like, uh, uh, democratic advocacy. Um, Nick Weaver, for example, who's up here at ICSI, um, very, very, very good guy. Um, in this uh, comment to the NSA review panel, we made a series of arguments here, and this is a public comment, so this is not an expert report, so like, here's what we think you should focus on for the thing you're doing. Um, we said if you're going to have a secret court that authorizes surveillance. Uh, you need to have technical, the courts would need to have someone with technical knowledge to evaluate the stuff that the NSA comes to you and says, oh yeah, we know what we're doing, don't worry about it, we're fine. Um, you need to have people with technical capabilities in the secret court or associated with the secret court to 
to tell the court, well, they don't know what they're saying here or whatever. Um, and because they don't have, this is the second part of the argument, because they don't have technical people at the court, you know, a few cases where they had to done massive overcollection because they didn't understand what they were approving. And so in one case, it's you know, NCT, uh, multiple, multiple communication technologies. You can think of that as they get sort of like a screenshot that's applied by your Gmail inbox. They're interested in one sort of to and from line in your inbox. There's a whole bunch of other ones there that you're maybe not discussing things with people in other countries. Um, and they claim that they cannot technically separate that, that one line from the other things. And if you use Gmail, open it up and look at it, if you're technically inclined, it's just a JSON structure. Very easy to discard all the other stuff that isn't the one line. Is that data they got directly from Google or is that data they collected? No, this is on the wire okay. upstream. Okay. So this is upstream, which means it's flying out in fiber, they pull it out um, using extremely sophisticated NARS insight process. Anyway, um, as it flies by, 10 gigabit, it's really crazy stuff. Um, the next argument we made is that these wholesale attacks, these attacks, that you heard about that are on cryptographic standards, other kinds of things, they weaken the security for everyone involved. It's not a targeted way of getting access to stuff from people. It, you're, you're unfortunately making everyone weaker all at once. Um, and the, finally, the most important argument I think we made, and this is one we're you're going to hear a lot about if you pay attention to from people like us, is that the US has these commitments in various forms to, to protect civil liberties and privacy. And those commitments demand that we treat non-US persons data with respect. So this is like Mark Zuckerberg, the, the guy who founded Facebook, showed up in DC and said, you know, when Obama says we're not collecting information from US people, that doesn't help me with a billion users, most of which, I believe, yeah, most of which cannot be US persons now. Um, that doesn't help my business, that doesn't help me, you know, offer a service that people want um, elsewhere. Um, now, we also know that they've been doing some, some things with cryptographic standards. So there's what we believe is a backdoor. It's actually kind of like a track board, but we'll talk about that if you know more about it. And then a random number generator that has this board name, called dual DC, DRVG. Um, it's clear, at least NIST has said, something, we believe something happened in the process of developing this random number generator. We don't know exactly what it is. Don't use it until we have more data about what's going on here. And in fact, I think they're going to say basically don't use it, because not only does it seem to have a track world, but it doesn't make very good random numbers, so don't do that. Um, but the, unfortunately, the, the realization that they may have snuck in a back door or snuck something into a cryptographic standard made people look around at other things NIST is doing. And NIST, you know, you know the people at NIST who do this stuff, they're some of the best in the world. There's like 15 of them, there's not a lot of them. They care a lot about making really good security standards. Um, there's one called SHA-3. This is a hash standard. This is something that turns like a file into a string of gibberish. If you change one little tiny pixel in the file, the string of gibberish changes all over again. Very useful for saying something's changed, um, detecting something's changed. Um, SHA-3 is really interesting. It is subject to a uh, five-year competition where 60 academic and research teams put in their not of crypto algorithms, and over five years we whittled down to the finals in October of 2012. This is an algorithm called Ketchak. Um, unfortunately, between October 2012 and now, there's been changes to the thing. The thing that won is a little different, and, and, and there's heated arguments about how different it is and what the differences are. But they made it, uh, they lowered the security properties on this particular standard. And in light, they, didn't, they did it before Snowden and stuff, but in light of the Snowden things, it looks kind of um, it, it looks a little suspect that they're lowering the security standards and changing this thing to more competition. Um, I wrote a blog post about this and figured there's like five people that care about this obscure cryptographic standard. No one cares about this thing. Um, it had totally brought our web server down. <laughs> and it totally crashed our web server. We had to sit there and restart Apache over and over again. not a place you want to be in. For various reasons, we don't have a lot. Um, but in the process of doing this, I realized that they need to be very careful from when something wins the competition 
to the point, after that, you take the, the math, the algorithm, when you write it up in a document that says, here's how people should put this into software. Um, you have to be very transparent and careful in that step where you're going to have this problem over and over again. People are going to say, oh, this is in the pocket of NSA, NSA, you make them do whatever they want. And we don't want that because this is the one place where crypto happens really, really well. Uh, the data model, the outcome, so to speak, here is that NIST appears to be listening to a lot of this feedback. And the shop three is going to be standardized and close to its original form, and the changes they are making are non controversial. And it has some crazy security mode that offers, you know, it's talking about like 560 bit pre image collision resistance, which is pretty wild. I don't know why anyone beats that, but whatever, it's the most reasons. That's great. Um, and now NIST is even doing something. We're doing a more broad review of every single cryptographic standard that they've ever written. It's like some 40 um, FIPS, Federal Information Processing Standards, and special publications. So they're going to bring in an expert, independent outside team to help them look and see who do we work with when we create this standard? Does the NSA evolve? Do we think of anything untoward out here? Do we need to change this thing? Are there any problems here? Um, and I think that, that's a pretty good uh, outcome. For this kind of stuff. It's hard to know exactly how this happened, um, but I'd like to think at least the transparency case was made. I was very transparent about these things in the new environment.